Thank you. So, welcome to the retitled Shootout at the Pass Corral, um, or Shootout at the Pass even, could be. The, um, before we get started here, uh, with people filtering in, how many people right now are running PostgreSQL on a public cloud? Uh, it's most of our audience. Okay, wait, out of those people, how many people are running on AWS? How many people are running it on a different public cloud? Ooh, okay. Yeah, well, I knew that AWS had industry dominance. So uh, this did get retitled because I was able to do more cloud testing before this talk, and we'll be covering a few additional uh, cloud options for you. Um, for some of the stuff, first, I, the, um, this is a work in progress. Um, some of our stuff is on GitHub. Um, I need to get the sort of data loading and that sort of thing on there. But this is the project that we're uh, working through for this big cloud testing effort. Um, I want to actually give thanks to my collaborator here, um, who is not able to fly out from New Zealand um, in order to join me for presentations, but Ruben Rubio Ray of manageacloud.com, um, who has been running a lot of the testing. Um, I also want to thank uh, Heroku um, and AWS um, for uh, helping with some of the tests and uh, giving us technical information when we were getting some weird test results. Um, so, uh, I, before we get started on some of the tests, first of all, what is the cloud? A lot of people use clouds. I don't really understand, but I find that, at least among our clients, a lot of people use various public clouds, and they don't have any really clear idea how they work. As far as they're concerned, they're, well, magic. But cloud hosting is not magic. Cloud hosting is just a bunch of servers with multiple layers of virtualization, shared storage, and an API. Right? You got those things, you're a cloud. And those things are not fundamentally different from other things that happened before, although they are, they make deployment and management substantially different. So the good things about putting your Postgres in a public cloud are fast deployment, um, as most people know, fast deployment, easy scale out by adding replicas or moving to larger instances, and the ability, and this is the critical thing for at least a lot of the people in the, the industry I deal with, the ability to minimize the number of ops staff that you have to have in order to run the same infrastructure, um, particularly eliminating a lot of the management of hardware um, that used to be a big part of running, say, a web business. Um, the other big advantage is that when you're just getting started or you're just starting a project, it's pretty cheap to host stuff on a public cloud. Um, now, there's a disadvantage there because as you need to use large amounts of resources, hosting stuff on a public cloud starts to become a lot more expensive than even owning your own hardware. Um, and that's how things, that's how hosting, that's how cloud hosting makes such a good business um, because the profitability in the high end is much better than the profitability in the low end. Now there are some other drawbacks to having Postgres in a public cloud. Uh, number one, system resources on cloud instances um, are not equal to even the same specified system resources on real hardware, and what's available is much narrower. I mean, uh, up until very, up until like a couple of years ago, um, for example, the largest, uh, the most cores you would get out of an Amazon cloud instance was seven or eight, I don't remember if it was seven or eight, one or, one or the other, whereas it was hard to actually buy your own hardware with less than 32 cores. Um, the other big issue is I, an additional exposure of attack surfaces uh, in terms of your security vulnerability. Um, because now attackers can come at you not only through the regular means, but they can try to come at you via the cloud framework, either by exploiting it or exploiting, taking advantage of that same ease of management to, for ease of attack. Um, as Code Spaces found out the hard way, um, last year. Uh, this was a startup that did not protect their Amazon login credentials adequately, got held hostage by an attacker, 
handled it badly and got wiped out completely. They don't exist as a company anymore. So um, now, that's the bad. The ugly um, is that everything is shared on a public cloud. You are sharing your space in the public cloud with thousands to millions of other users, including network and IO and storage and CPU, which means that your performance is dependent on someone else's peak load. Or to put it another way, sharing is not caring. Um, the final thing to think about in terms of hosting, post, uh, hosting Postgres in the cloud is that cloud instances are meant to be ephemeral, right? They burn up, they go away, things happen, spin up another instance. And this means that a lot of things that in on-premises hosting you might put off need to be done up front on the cloud in terms of having a serious DR plan with multiple kinds of redundancy because you pretty much have to plan. I mean, it was always the case with even regular hardware, right? You have to kind of plan for disk to fail, et cetera, but you put in good RAID and that's more of an eventual consideration. If you're hosting stuff in a public cloud, pretty much assume that whatever you're building could disappear tomorrow um, or five minutes from now. And for that reason, you should be prepared for that to happen. So now from the other side of this thing, um, I, because I've done this speaking to a few people who are more on the cloud side of things, database side of things, is, is why should we be interested in Postgres on the cloud um, from a testing perspective? And the answer is that transactional databases, as far as I know, are pretty much unique in workloads in working out all of the different parts of a system, right? We use CPUs, we use RAM, we do I.O., we do network I.O., and we do it all at the same time. Um, and one thing database geeks have been good at in terms of database engines for a while is working out ways to 100% utilize all system resources because there's never enough throughput. So having sort of set up, you know, what we're, you know, the, the, the interest in the cloud and why we're sort of starting on this benchmark route, I want to introduce you to a few clouds that we're going to be talking about. Um, we've got, um, actually in this presentation today, we're covering six public clouds. Um, Rackspace, RDS, DigitalOcean, EC2, uh, Google Compute Engine, and Heroku. Um, now people say, hey, wait a minute, there's seven guys there. So um, I will tell you who the seventh is near the end of the presentation. Um, but, uh, let's get started on describing some of these. So uh, the first we're going to start with the three clouds that are actually all kind of different versions of Amazon Web Services. Um, we've got the straight up EC2 option, our gunslinger, roll your own on EC2. Um, we've got RDS, um, who I've assigned to the rancher. Um, and we've got the dandy, which is Heroku, um, in, in terms of our cloud. So, um, there are actually other options um, on AWS. Um, uh, Mark cornered me and, and asked me, please don't forget that we have a cloud. Um, I haven't actually done any testing on the Enterprise DB thing, mostly because I didn't expect it to have different performance characteristics um, than the other options, but um, I might be doing that in the future. Um, now, these all three um, AWS options share certain characteristics you know, in, in terms of advantages, disadvantages together. Um, one is um, you have access to a comprehensive API that covers everything you would want to do with that. Like, you're never actually required to log in to the web screen, et cetera. You can control everything about those clouds in code. Um, and that can be a little different from some of the other public clouds um, where um, you discover certain functions and features, certain management operations that require logging into the vendor's web interface and doing things in a point and clicky way, which is not really good for any kind of automated operation or deployment. Um, the other thing is that because of relying on the AWS backbone, you have global distribution with 11 data centers around the world, something like that, um, you know, making it available all over. 
Um, and then the other big thing about going with one of the AWS-based clouds is that you have all of the other Amazon services available if you want them for part of building an application, which is a truly colossal number of services. None of the other competing, you know, completely separate backbone clouds have anywhere near this variety of stuff um, in terms of caching stuff and routing and DNS controllers and um, special security things and deployment automation and all of these other widgets that can make it faster to build an application instead of writing your own software for that. Um, the, um, so, so that's your, your sort of advantages. Um, regardless of which one of the, the AWS clouds that you choose, you have all of that stuff available. So let's now go with the basic, and this was the only option for Postgres on a public cloud for quite a while, um, which was roll your own on AWS EC2, right? Let's go ahead and put together our own thing. And it's still, I would guess, probably the numerically most common option um, because, so, you know, because people know how to do it. It's really simple. All you do is create an EC2 instance, install PostgreSQL on it, configure PostgreSQL, and you can run. Now, um, here's, I've tried to give a little sort of profile of the different clouds in terms of what's available. So here's our profile for Roll Your Own EC2. We're on a platform as a service cloud, um, and any administration is, is up to you. Any HA is up to you. Um, there are tools available through the other Amazon stuff, but, but um, you have to put them together. Uh, but versions, extensions, extra uh, versions and extensions are anything you want to install. You know, if if you really have some reason to download Postgres 7.4 and run it in a public cloud, not that I would recommend that, because there are many known security holes in a version that old. Um, you can do it, um, and any extension you want, regardless of what permissions it needs, you can do it. Um, there are no additional features to this cloud beyond what what AWS offers in general. There's no special cloud features for this. Um, and, you know, your general cost is going to be pretty cheap. Um, now, AWS offers a bunch of different instance types. This is already out of date as of uh, last week, I guess, because um, we've now got the, uh, some of the, the Generation 4 instance types available, a bunch of the Generation 4 instance types available. Um, but it's still the case kind of um, in terms of databases that, that Amazon divides stuff into these different sort of classes. Um, general purpose is good for most kinds of Postgres databases. If you have some reason that you have a really CPU intensive workload, you might want to do commute optimized. Most of the time I end up with the memory optimized in order to maximize data caching. Um, and then if you're going to do data warehousing, you might go with one of the i-series ones. Um, the, um, the big thing about this is that, um, as we'll go over, latency and shared storage. Um, this is true even if you run your own shared storage, is much higher than latency on local storage. And for that reason, being able to cache your whole database or at least your working set in memory on the cloud instance becomes more critical on a public cloud than it would be in on-prem stuff. And so if you're choosing where to spend your money, getting enough RAM to cache the entire database um, is a really good strategy um, on any public cloud, certainly on AWS. Um, now, AWS offers a number of storage options. Um, the one that we use for pretty much all production um, database servers is EBS plus provisioned IOPS. Um, there's a new option in this area, the GP2 option, um, which was not available at the time I was doing my testing. Expect that the next time I give this in April, that will be included in the test results um, and on my blog. Um, and the reason for that is that EBS plus provisioned IOPS you know, gives you some guarantees of durability and guarantees of consistent throughput. Um, now, the general SSD option can be really good for bursting stuff, but at least with the first generation GP stuff, you were a lot more influenced by, other, by shared peak usage from other people who were accessing the same storage. Um, and so the throughput would be fairly variable, and also if your database workload is not bursty, um, you'd see performance dropping off. There's now the GP2 stuff, which Grant talked about yesterday, and so he, you get that from his talk even on the slides if you weren't in it. Um, now, one of the things you can do to get higher performance is to actually use 
instant storage, some of the higher end instances come with a significant amount of SS, local SSD storage, which much lower latency than block storage. Um, the disadvantage to this is that it is fundamentally riskier in terms of data loss. There are a number of different things that can happen on AWS in terms of unplanned restarts. We don't even actually lose the instance, it just restarts unplanned that can cause data corruption on local instance storage. Um, the, um, and you don't have some of the snapshotting tools for doing things like binary backups that can be really useful for data redundancy for using local instance storage. So um, this is a lot more of a practical option for, say, a replica um, than it might be for your master node. Uh, another important thing to keep in mind is that provisioned IOPS is not the same thing as throughput. Um, you know, is that Amazon is guaranteeing a certain number of um, is guaranteeing a certain number of I/O operations per second, um, and and actually have done a fantastic job of delivering exactly that within a couple, you know, within like five, ten percent. Um, but um, IOPS are limited to eight K, which is actually kind of convenient for Postgres. No, thirty two K. Okay, so. But one of the things that I've, I've noticed in some of these patterns, which has caused, required us to have really increases on IOPS, is that certain kinds of operations the database engine will do, such as a straight up index scan, results in having an IOP for every row of the data that it's looking up if the data is fairly sparsely distributed. And so for that particular operation, um, then your PRIOPS limit becomes the number of rows per second. So 10,000 IOPS or 1,000 IOPS sounds reasonably fast. 1,000 rows per second, if you're trying to scan a million rows, is not very fast. Um, so think about that in terms of configuration and in terms of actually getting the throughput that you want. Um, I, as I mentioned, you need to set up redundancy um, I, of several kinds. I'd recommend that we always, anytime we deploy, we always set up both a continuous backup and replicas. Um, you need to monitor for instance failure, um, and you are on a shared network, so using SSL becomes not an option but a necessity. So having said all that sort of setup, um, we decided to pick two instance sizes to test performance on comparatively. Um, one is our small instance size. Um, so this is the M3 medium, one core, um, almost four gigabytes of RAM size. Um, with 40 gigabytes of storage with 1,000 provisioned IOPS. Um, you know, this was picked as in, this is the sort of instance we would deploy for somebody who has a PostgreSQL server that is an important part of their application but is not particularly high performance and they're looking to save money. Um, and then we had a sort of large performance instance and this is a bit higher performance. This is not as high end as we would get but we had a sort of limited budget for doing the testing so I needed to pick an instance size that was reasonably high end, but that we could afford to deploy many of to do the testing. Um, and so that was the R3 double extra large, eight cores, 60 gigabytes of RAM, 200 gigabytes, uh, 4,000 provisioned IOPS. That's a large instance. And so the instance sizes that we picked on other clouds were based on trying to match this particular profile. Um, we also figured out an important thing is figuring out cost performance ratios. And so this is the cost calculations that we have. Fortunately, this cost calculation is already out of date. Um, uh, Amazon has had pricing updates and that sort of thing. So um, I'll be redoing these cost calculations sometime soon because they no longer apply to the current costs that are available. Um, the, um, and so this is the sort of full redundancy. Um, the, oh, this is the, our update in terms of new storage options available. Um, Another thing that you can do if downtime is not that critical for you, you just don't want to avoid losing data, is that you can run an instance and you're really looking to save money, um, you can run an instance that's just doing continuous backup to S3 um, and ignore the whole replication issue and that would be your sort of cheapest option. Um, the higher end instance is a little bit more expensive. Um, the, um, again, you know, looking for updates. So, I, second one, the relational database service, um, Amazon Postgres RDS, we've got the whole crew here. And this is for people who say, hey, 
I really like Amazon Web Services, but I don't really want to deal with all of this management of Postgres stuff. Um, and I would like someone to do it for me. Um, so this is what's otherwise known as DBAS, or Database as a Service. Um, you don't deal with the OS. You don't deal with system configuration. You're just effectively getting port 5432 um, and some API-based configuration management interfaces. Um, the advantage of this is something called SCDBA, which is somebody else is the DBA. Um, so you, in theory, don't need DBA support, and in practice, you need some. Um, but certainly in terms of th basic things like uptime, backups are automated, um, some of the configuration is automated, updates are automated. Um, and for small development shops where they have a couple of DevOps, they want to manage everything, this can be a really good option. The disadvantage of database as a service is that it limits the options that you have with Postgres. Only specific versions are available. Um, uh, only a certain, a limited list of extensions are available. Uh, some of the configuration parameters you're not allowed to change, um, particularly security configuration, um, tends to be fairly locked down in terms of what they support and what they don't support. Um, other configuration may or may not be available. Um, and of course, it costs more because you're paying somebody else to be your DBA, at least part of the time, and that person has to be paid. So, um, so looking at that for the profile, so this is our database as a service cloud. Um, administration is mostly automatic, and, and by I say mostly automatic is that, um, like I said, back up some things, other, issue, other things uh, not so automated. Um, there's a couple of different HA options on RDS. Um, one is that you can run replicas like you would on EC2, um, and the other is they have this thing called multi-availability zone, um, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, versions currently available are 9.3 and 9.4. Um, there's a list of about two dozen extensions that they have available that, that are pre-cleared, and you can use those, but you can't use anything else. Um, there's no particular bonus features for the cloud itself. Um, the, um, and the price point on this is moderate. Uh, so I did mention multi-availability zone. So this is Amazon's automated failover uptime uh, guarantee sort of thing. It's synchronous replication to another node with automated failover and, and DNS redirection. Um, the, um, it's a good way for guaranteed uptime. There is, as you'll see when I do the ratings, major performance overhead associated with this because we are talking about a form of synchronous replication that operates as I understand it on the file system level. Um, so, third Amazon Cloud, our dandy Heroku. This is for people who say, I just want to develop. The cloud should handle everything for me automatically. Um, this is our sort of extreme point of database as a service management of, um, I really want, I want to have port 5432 and I want someone else's job to be to worry about everything else. Um, so this is a, another database, database as a service cloud. Administration is fully automated. As a matter of fact, you can't really do any administration of your own even if you wanted to. Um, HA is a combination of uh, replication and point in time recovery with automation around it um, and a set of different options for the level of uptime guarantee that you want. Uh, the versions that are available currently 9.3.9.4. Heroku also tends to put Postgres betas up there for the users to test. Uh, again, there's about two dozen extensions that are pre-cleared that you can install. There's several extra cloud features, um, and the pricing is on the high side um, compared to our other options. Uh, so I want to mention some of those extra cloud features. Um, one is, one of the big things that people get out of Heroku is this Git-based, <coughs> a Git and uh, Rails rake-based instance management, including management of the database. That works really well with continuous integration development uh, shops, agile shops. Um, they've also added a couple of unique features that own. Uh, data clips are basically sort of web shareable materialized views um, that are really awesome if you have to share little snippets of data um, with your customers or other people on your team. Um, and they've simplified our replication model through this sort of follower thing, um, making it much, much e easier and conceptually easier for developers, um, for web developers to understand um, uh, setting up, you know, having replicas for Postgres stuff. Um, now, the biggest piece of dandy bling is this, um, which is when I started my testing, 
and I launched you know, the first two large Heroku instances. Um, in 24 hours, I got an email from a Heroku staff member asking if I needed any help with anything. This is not something I got on any other cloud, no matter how much of a bill I ran up. Um, <laughs> so that is mainly, so when we go later on into pricing and you see Heroku's pricing, you can understand this is part of what you're paying for. Um, so Heroku options are a lot more limited, five database sizes, three levels of HA uptime, and that's it, 15 possibilities. Um, so the two Heroku sizes that we chose for this, the standard two, which is 3.5 gigabytes of RAM and shared hosting, and the standard six, which is 60 gigabytes of RAM, um, gives you a dedicated instance. Um, uh, and, and those were our two options for testing. So again, what you're saying, we're trying to keep a comparable set of instances here. Now let's move on to some of the non-Amazon-based stuff. So Rackspace, Rackspace is a cloud. They're a hosting company, of course they have a cloud. Um, and the main reason for people to be in Rackspace seems to be this, which is, I have servers at Rackspace already and I want to expand to a cloud. Um, we've got a bunch of clients who are doing basically, you know, the main advantage of the Rackspace system, which is what they call hybrid hosting, where you have some rack servers and some cloud servers. Um, this is again, we're back to platform as a service, it's not database as a service. Um, administration is mostly DIY, although they have a bunch of managed infrastructure options, um, which at least involve management on the OS level if they don't involve helping you manage the database. Um, any HA for the database that you have is do it yourself. There are some rack space, you know, cloud tools um, that you can use as building blocks for this in terms of DNS and, and availability tools, but you have to set it up yourself. Um, since you're installing this yourself, any version, any extension, the extras is this hybrid cloud option, um, and again, our price is back to a moderate level. Um, now, I did say they have some support options. So one of the interesting things that Rackspace has done, you know, their, their big slogan is fanatical support, and a support component is required with your cloud server purchase. It's added on on a per hour basis. Um, it gets cheaper the more cloud instances you have because they're sort of pooling it together. Um, and you can bump this up to higher levels of support um, from Rackspace. But they won't actually help you with Postgres because they they're not staffed for that. Like they'll help you with everything around Linux, et cetera, and their Linux people are top notch. But in terms of helping you with Postgres, they're gonna be, that's not covered. Um, now, one of the things about Rackspace storage is that, um, well, Rackspace has an external block store. They really push you towards instant storage, and actually on these smaller cloud instances, you, the block store is not even available as an option. Um, and I don't know if Rackspace instant storage carries the same risks that AWS instant storage does. Um, I don't have enough information for that. Uh, but this is gonna be important when you see the performance figures, because on the smaller instance, we had to use instant storage, which changes the performance profile um, of the Rackspace servers. Uh, sizing here, so these are the instances we're using Rackspace, general 1.4 um, and memory 160 um, for the small and the large instances respectively. Now, I assigned Google Compute Engine to the Drifter, um, not because I feel that Google is particularly ne'er-do-well, um, but because um, they're uh, a bit of a latecomer to this party and they seem to be entering the market with the intention of being the cheapest option. Um, they're not actually, but they're the cheapest option among the big players. Um, so, you know, hence the drifter. And, and this seems to be the main reason to use GCE, right? Is you like the general concept of AWS and EC2 and you want to take advantage of Google's lowball pricing and lots and lots of free credits. Um, the, um, again, this is platform as a service, at least as far as Postgres is concerned. Um, administration, HA, do it yourself. Uh, versions available, anything you want. The one sort of cloud extra is that they have built in a fair amount of Docker integration for anybody who does Docker. Anybody here do Docker stuff? So they've built in a fair amount of Docker integration, which is something that's still coming soon on most of the other clouds. Um, and the price is cheap. So these are two instances. N1 standard one, N1 high mem ape. Um, again, reasonably comparable to the other ones. Now, our final of the six that we're gonna talk about here is the KID DigitalOcean. Um, DigitalOcean is a KID uh, in, in both in, in sort of size and orientation and in attitude. Um, 
uh, which you'd know if you've seen any of their advertisements. They're really catering to 25-year-old developers in terms of who they advertise to. Um, and I think that's kind of appropriate. Uh, the main reason to use it seems to be, I want something that's cheap, simple, and fast, and I don't want any other stuff. Um, so this is platform as a service, again, like the other ones. Um, there are no extras. There are almost no cloud, meaningful cloud services of any kind available on DigitalOcean um, in terms of, of anything that would help you build stuff out. And, but the pricing is ridiculously cheap. Like as in, um, I look at that pricing and I'm like, how long is it going to be before they burn through all their VC money? Because that's got to be measured in months at this point. Um, the other problem with the kid is that the kid tends to get himself shot up a lot. Um, the, um, there's no block store available in DigitalOcean at all. Everything is ephemeral instant storage. Um, the nodes are basically completely non-durable um, from, from my perspective. You know, I wouldn't trust anything there to be up um, longer. There's no storage cloud. There's nothing, there's no S3 equivalent for backups either. Um, and no available HA features from the cloud. So you're completely on your own on the DigitalOcean end of things. Um, so this is the sizing. DigitalOcean was the one where we had the hardest time picking instances that matched the sizes of the other clouds because their instance sizing is very different and they have a very limited menu of instance sizes available. So we had to go with um, an instance on the small end that had two rather than one core and on the large end instance that had more cores but slightly less RAM. So it's not exactly matching up. Um, there are other clouds, which I will get to testing as I have time. Um, that would include EDB++, as I mentioned, um, uh, Red Hat OpenShift, uh, Joyent, um, which actually um, is, it's a little, it's a different kind of a cloud, but it has some nice options for Postgres. Um, Azure, um, I've had people from Microsoft emailing me, so they want Azure included in this, and sure, why not? Um, so, time for some performance figures. So, let me explain what we did so far, um, which involves mainly PG Bench. How many people here have used PG Bench? Your people know PG Bench, right? So there's some advantages of PG Bench, and the reason why we started with it. Ships with Postgres, micro benchmark, really fast setup and teardown compared to other benchmarks, which is really important when you are on an automated basis, starting up a bunch of instances, running a benchmark, collecting stats, shutting them down, um, and then running the next one, and having to pay for all this. So the, um, some disadvantages, though. Uh, PG Bench's access pattern is fairly narrow. You're basically doing random single row lookups and updates, which doesn't match a lot of people's real workloads. Um, it's very reliant on single row write latency, and it's not very tunable. As a matter of fact, when we started doing the benchmarks, we actually had two different profiles on the non-DBAAS clouds, one of a configured Postgres and one of an unconfigured Postgres. And on the small instances, that made no difference at all um, because of PG Bench's access pattern. It made, as a matter of fact, Sometimes the configured instance was slower. Um, the, um, so you won't actually be seeing the configured versus unconfigured in the, in the initial results for that reason. Um, but we ran with it and we said, okay, what we'll do with PG Bench is we'll actually do three different sort of sizes. Um, one is the in-memory read-write where you have a database that's about half the size of RAM um, and you're doing write transactions on it. The second is with the same database do a read-only workload of read-only queries. And the third is generate a database which is larger than RAM, 150 to 200% the size of RAM, and do write transactions. Because we expected the different clouds to perform differently on these different workloads, and actually they did. Um, all right, you can look at the slides later. This is the actual setup that we used for these. Um, so, now from these we're trying to get two different metrics. Um, one is obviously PG Bench's standard output, which is TPS, transactions per second, right, zero benchmark. The other thing we actually recorded was load time um, because it is the one other thing we can get out of PG Bench. This is for the amount of time for generating the regular database. And for at least some of my clients, the consideration of how long does it take to load, to do a whole bunch of inserts into this database, straight up inserts into the database, is actually a significant characteristic because we have some clients that are doing that. Um, you know, and it's better to have two metrics than one. Um, some other conditions, this was all Postgres 9.3 because that was the version that was available across all of the various clouds that we were using. Um, uh, unfortunately, OSs could not be made consistent. We initially were going to try to do it on all CentOS and we couldn't do that um, on uh, one of the clouds for reasons. 
Um, and so it's actually a mix of CentOS 7 and Ubuntu 14.04, um, which is regrettable, um, but there wasn't a way around it without spending a whole lot of time. Um, and PG Bench was, uh, but one of the other things we did is that, by the way, so you should know for each of these, either they're pairs, right? So if we're doing the large instance, we have a large instance running PG Bench and a large instance with the Postgres database server. Um, because, you know, the, we didn't want to do it all on the same machine um, because network I.O. is important for real world performance. And then, of course, we had to run all of these things a whole bunch of times. Um, and the reason we had to run a whole bunch of times, well, let me show you a box plot. Not that kind of box plot, this kind of box plot. Um, and box plot is something you do in statistics, right? We're looking at distribution of data. And this is actually the distribution of data from, I, I think this is the read-only test on EC2 um, from our first set of runs. And you can see that there's a fair amount of difference between the slowest run and the fastest run. There's a lot of difference between the slowest run and the fastest run, actually from a multiply, right? Because if you take it from the median, the slowest run was a third the speed of the median, and the fastest run was four times the speed of the median. So this is one of the first important things we learned in the cloud is, I always knew that instance performance was variable, but doing a whole set of benchmarks really shows you how variable it is. It's really variable. Um, but given that level of variability, it was important for us to throw out outliers um, except noting where we had abnormal numbers of outliers in terms of performance. So in the case of load time, where smaller load time is better, um, I'll be giving you statistics for the median and the 90% level of load time. And by 90% I mean 90% of databases will load in this time or less. Um, and for, the, um, for TPS, we'll be giving you the median and the 10%, as in you know 90% of servers were faster than this. So, here's, here's our benchmarks. And, and by the way, again, I'm going to note this. I've cautioned people multiple times. Um, there are comparability problems between some of these. Um, you'll see is Rackspace, we'll talk about Rackspace and DigitalOcean do not have the same, I, we don't think they have the same durability guarantees uh, from I.O. Um, as the other clouds do, um, which changes performance. Um, the, um, well, I'm providing an HA option with all of these. It's not necessarily automated HA in all cases. Um, in a lot of cases, I'm just saying this is what it looks like with a replica. Um, instance sizes are not identical, and instance OSs are not identical. So do some of your own comparisons. The most important caution is this is a work in progress. We are doing ongoing testing. We learn new things through doing the performance testing, and we revise the performance tests. Uh, but we did discover some interesting things. So. Um, let's talk about cost. That is a little more fixed. This is public. It changes all the time, as I note. All the, um, the Amazon costs are already out of date, I believe, um, since I made this slide. the slide. Um, but here's our cost for, in the small node, for an HA instance versus a non-HA instance. And these are, the for three of the clouds, these are reasonably close, and this is, by the way, per month, um, reasonably close to um, comparable. Um, the, um, now, two of them are not, DigitalOcean and, and Google Compute Engine. You're like, what the hell's going on here? Why is this so cheap? Um, I, you know, and we believe, you know, and I talked to actually an analyst about this, a news analyst, we believe that both of these clouds are operating below cost um, in an effort to gain market share. So the, these are really cheap right now. Don't necessarily expect them to be really cheap a year from now. Um, now, large nodes, we actually see a lot more differentiation. Um, particularly, whoops, particularly um, Heroku um, charges a lot more for their large nodes, mostly because they expect to do a lot more support, direct support of large node customers. Um, and so they charge a lot more for that. And we get a little bit more differentiation with the databases of service clouds on the high end. Um, now, first performance metric, load time. So this is our small in-memory database. This is the smallest database, about a gigabyte and a half. Um, we're doing, you know, these straight up inserts into memory. Uh, shorter bars are better. Um, so the, um, now you'll see actually a couple of things from this. Um, one of them right here is, this is, you see the big effect of having, of loading into instant storage versus loading into remote block storage. Um, the, um, I, because the latency is lower and the PG Bench loads things via inserts, not via copy, so latency per row is a significant metric. Um, and so these end up being a lot faster 
um, with a lower durability guarantee. If we actually use instant storage on EC2, we actually see a similar profile, which we'll see later on. Um, now, the other thing that we have here is we have slow loading on, on RDS, which is something I contacted Grant and his team about. Um, and we figured out that what was actually going on here was a difference in how stuff was configured in terms of storage, which is a bunch of these, you know, Heroku with RDS, with my EC2 configuration, um, we, are, we have archiving turned on. But archiving is going to a different, with, with my configuration, like EC2 and Heroku, uh, GCE, we have archiving turned on, but archiving is going to a separate volume. Um, with RDS, the archiving gets counted against your general allocation of IOPS. Um, so if you look at it another way, we actually have slightly more IOPS available on the other ones. And in a load test, that makes a huge difference. Um, the, um, so, so we could actually configure the RDS for higher IOPS, but that would also increase the cost. Um, so you can sort of do the trade here, yeah? Oh, the client was an EC2 instance um, the, um, of, the, of the appropriate size, yes. And in the, same, in the same region when we, in the same region and in the same availability zone when we could determine that. Um, with Heroku, we can't really determine what availability zone things are in, um, and so we just had to sort of guess. The, um, so um, now, next size database, um, about seven gigabytes, you know, uh, for the small instance. And so we're getting a little bit larger and we have the opportunity to fill up all of memory. Um, and then this changes, and one of the, the things that you actually see that changes a lot is that Google Compute Engine actually gets a lot slower once you fill up memory. Um, and I don't know exactly what they're doing in their architecture, but, but we actually see that in a lot of the other places. Um, now one of the other things that we'll see, well actually I'll, I'll talk about this when we get to TPS. Um, because the Heroku small instance is sort of interesting. Then let's move up to the next size database, which is a large in-memory database. Um, and so then this is loading, um, how big do we make this? About 20 gigabytes um, database size uh, on a much larger instance. Um, and the interesting thing that we see here is that um, the archiving becomes much less of an impact on the RDS instances relative to the size of the database. Um, and then the only thing we're seeing here is, I mentioned that there's a heavy performance penalty to using the multi-availability zone synchronous replication. And you can see it here, the difference between, the reason why I have two sets of bars for RDS versus RDS multi-availability zone is because the performance profile is very different. Um, and you see that Google may have optimized something else, but they don't seem to be optimizing I.O. Um, for just raw I.O. Um, now, one of the interesting things to do here is to actually do a cost comparison here. Um, is to say, based on that estimated cost per month, let's compare how much does it cost me to load one megabyte per second. Um, and you get sort of a dramatic profile. We have our sort of newcomers who are underpricing things that are really cheap. We have Rackspace that looks relatively cheap because of the instant storage issue. Um, and then we have RDS and Heroku, which are regular, and then because of our penalty and loads for the multi-availability zone, um, RDS multi-availability zone is relatively expensive. Um, large in memory looking fairly similar here, except that the Heroku pricing goes way up. So let's get some actually transaction processing here. Um, this is the small in memory read write test. Um, so doing 15 minutes of PG bench read write um, in terms of transactions per second here. And um, I have an interesting sort of distribution. And this is actually an interesting place where, so we've got a couple of things going on here. Uh, DigitalOcean and Rackspace, again, latency dominated. Uh, the instant storage kind of pulling ahead there. Um, I, for a couple of interesting things here, we see actually we get really good performance on the Heroku small instance. And I dug some into this. I, I uh, contacted some of the Heroku people, dug some into this. The Heroku small instances, unlike the large instances, are actually on shared Amazon instances where they've distributed multiple Postgres instances running on the same shared Amazon instance. So that means that if I'm going to slam one of those, I really have a great opportunity to be a bad neighbor um, and overutilize other people's resources. Um, and so I can actually get a lot more performance than I'm paying for out of a Heroku small instance for that reason. Um, the in-memory read only um, 
is a little bit different. I was actually expecting Heroku to do a lot better on this, um, given that configuration. What we actually encountered from Heroku on this was a lot more variability than we were expecting. And I think this has to do with the bad neighbor problem, is that here I was hitting, um, you know, despite the tests, I hit a significant number of occasions on which someone else was being my bad neighbor. Um, the, um, and, uh, you know, EC2, RDS, more or less equivalent. Um, Google performing a lot better here. Um, and this really implies to me with the Google Cloud, as you might be implied by Google Compute Engine, they've done a lot to optimize CPU and RAM usage, um, even though they seem to be ignoring I.O. performance. Um, the, um, now, uh, I, wait, didn't we already do small on-disk read-write? Oh, no, this is on-disk read-write, small. So again, when we get bigger than memory, what's our performance like? And you can see the difference. Google Compute Engine drops. Um, and we've got, uh, you know, Rackspace, DigitalOcean taking off because of instant storage speeds um, and some of the rest. So I'm a little behind. So then let's look at the large instance. And large instance, we get a very different sort of performance profile. Um, one of the interesting things that we actually saw here in the large instance is we're getting some kind of throttling on the Google Compute Engine and Rackspace. And other stuff that we did with those two indicated that there was some kind of throttling present. Um, it's not anything that they expressly do um, that's like in their docs or terms of service, but it's clearly happening because of the sort of ceiling that we hit at 500. And I think it's maybe I.O. throttling. Um, uh, you know, you can sort of see for the rest of this, uh, we got really good and fairly similar performance off of RDS and Heroku um, on the large instances. Um, the EC2 instance is getting a higher degree of variability across um, because you can see the difference between the 10% and the median here. Um, uh, DigitalOcean kind of all over the place. Um, Read-only was a lot more stable um, at a much higher level. Um, it was actually interesting how much the large read-only was almost the same um, across all the clouds. In this case, the reason why Rackspace is ahead is that their large instance has more cores. Um, the, um, and then the one other thing that we got actually off of this, and I want to rerun some of the tests, is on the multi-availability zone instance, in the read-only test, we kept having instances stall, um, which was interesting. They would just stop responding for like 10, 30 seconds. Um, and, and that really killed the throughput on enough runs to show up on the 10% level. Um, large on disk, and here's where the throttling comes in. We couldn't run the large on disk tests on Google Compute Engine or Rackspace the data load never completed um, before we hit our four hour timeout with the test runs. Um, so here we've got you know, our transactions per second. Again, we're seeing a lot more equivalent performance actually across clouds at this size, which is interesting. Um, I, again, I've got some price calculations in here, which you can see in the slides. I actually have a lot more graphs than this, which I'll be posting on my blog. Um, but let's actually finish up here because I'm running out of time. Now, I did say that there was a seventh ombre here that, we're, that, that I didn't mention. Um, and that is running what I call running with scissors mode, um, which I've talked about before. And the idea of running with scissors mode is you disable all of Postgres's durability guarantees. Um, and you disable cloud durability guarantees by running, doing things like running on instant storage, et cetera. Um, and then you run uh, tests. And so adding the scissors mode, we can actually get a higher level performance than we have this. Now, I was actually going over these initial results with Andres early on in the Hacker's Lounge, and he pointed out some stuff that I hadn't done in the configuration. Um, so I think I can actually make this much higher than it is, um, the, um, uh, which we will be testing in the future. So what's ahead for the set of benchmarks? Well, number one, I actually want to get a more complete benchmark working. This is probably going to be DVD store because Jignesh has packaged that up for Docker um, so that I can actually use it um, and deploy it reasonably. Um, the, um, I would kind of like something that's a little bit more webby with a much higher mixture of reads, like say 10% writes, 90% reads. Um, I may need to write that myself because it doesn't seem to be anything out there. Um, um, I really want a graph geek to collaborate with me in this because my skills at generating graphs suck um, and I really don't want to spend a lot of time learning IPython so that I can actually get different graphs out of this. So if any of you are a graphing geek and you're really interested in this project, please jump on with this and, and help me generate some better visualizations. Um, so here's all of my contact information. And I think we have, we have a minute, two minutes for questions. Did you have a checklist for Vaughn on your, uh, on which, uh, 
Um, not on EC2. Do you have checksums turned on? Yeah. Oh, okay. See, there we go. Why didn't you mention that earlier when I was doing the data load test? That would have made that would that makes a substantial difference. Yeah. Well, I, okay. The. Um, yeah. So the problem is that this is just constantly leading to more tests that I need to do. <laughs> the. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, well, so manage the manage a cloud footed the bill for a bunch of this. Uh, by the way, so what they do is they actually offer a tool that knows all of the cloud APIs so that you can have a single deployment process for the different clouds, which was invaluable to me in doing this. Um, so. I don't know, it was a few thousand dollars? Your, your employer paid for the Heroku tests. Oh, you, you're not, oh, okay. Heroku paid for the Heroku tests. The, um, so, um, the, um, so, um, but the others, you know, there, um, we paid for the Amazon time. I don't know what our Amazon, what was our Amazon bill last month in order of magnitude? Okay, oh, so it wasn't bad. I mean, so the nice thing about this is even though we're running lots of instances, most of them like the small instances, you know, total elapsed testing time, and this is why I liked using PG Bench, would be 30 minutes, right? Is most of these clouds still by the hour or some still in the fifth range? Uh, they're all by the hour. Um, one of the reasons why I hadn't done Linode, for example, is that Linode doesn't really like doing by the hour. Um, uh, and for that reason, they'd be prohibitively expensive to test. Anyone else? Okay, one more, and then we're, he, he raised his hand first, and then we're done. Do you think many people will want to go between the clouds, or do you think they're going to pick one of these up and then take them for a long time? Does it make sense to like a hybrid or layer on top of that where you can pull them in and all the time? I kind of think for most applications, I can imagine network latency would kill you for that. Um, I, I can't, the question was whether or not people would want to have sort of multi different cloud provider applications. And it's hard for me to imagine any application where that would make sense from a performance standpoint because of the, the sort of inner data center, inner network latency that would, that would be an issue. Oh, and also paying for the data transfer costs as well, which are substantial. The, uh, one of the things I actually did learn through this, by the way, is that the vendor that has the highest data transfer cost is Rackspace, which I had not been expecting. Um, uh, they make it very easy to pay 10 times as much in data transfer costs if you're paying for hosting. Um, so, and that's something to consider for real applications. Anyway, I think we're done. I'm happy to answer more questions outside the room where the next speaker sets up. So thank you. <laughs>